for exploration and development. So the plan of GMPC is with time to be our own operators, to take over the jobs that the international oil companies are doing. So that's what Exploco was set up for. We have Tradco, which is our trading company. We have GMPC. We have some JVs with TechNIP. So again, about the building capacity, we have some people working with TechNIP with a joint venture. So they help in, in, um, in building facilities for, for Ghana. So I'll start off with uh, the health and safety. Like I said, that's our, our, our number one priority. So our health and safety team, they're in charge of all the um, HSE management. So it's from as little as identifying a cable that's lined that as a trip hazard to taking care of the AHS on the FPSOs. If there's any spillage on the oceans, they are led to, they report it, they work with EPA. So it's just a, a vast, a vast um, scope of work that the EHS do. They ensure that our partners, uh, they implement a robust um, system to manage the health and safety issues. So before GMPC used to be the regulators of the, the oil industry, before the Petroleum Commission was set up. And, and we still go on the FPSOs to ensure, so the production engineers always on the FPSO looking at the flows and uh, productions. So this is our reservoir engineering department, and it looks like this is where I've seen a lot of simulations, and since I've been here, I've been lost quite some time, but I'm sure if our reservoir engineers were here, they would be happy. But they are having our training now, and that's some of the things that they do now, and I wish that you people could provide to us. So what they do is we buy softwares, and then we have the developers come in to train us how to use the softwares. So I, I joined the reservoir team last week for a training, and that's why there's no reservoir here, because they're all having that training, another training now, as of now. So, so what they do is they, they interpret the PVT data. They work with a lot of the models that, that the companies will, will produce, and then we go buy from them. So we buy line instances, and they're very expensive. I mean, if, if uh, Ghana could produce all these things, it would definitely cut our cost. So they perform numerical modeling studies using the industrial acclaim software, like I've said. And they, they produce the forecast, try to look at the financials, if it's profitable. They look at all the fields that we work with. So this is the well engineer. So this is basically just drilling engineers. So the drilling engineering department, and before I go on, let me just say that the, the engineering department is the reservoir engineering, production engineering, the well engineering, facilities engineering. And we throw in EHS now, but they are different uh, department assistants now. So with drilling prognostics and designs and casing studies and cement calculations, so these are the operations that the, the well engineers work with. They have regular trips to the, to the drilling rig. So I talked about the FPSOs. So the FPSO is the floating production storage and a floating um, vessel. So that's where most of our production people go. The drilling people go on the drilling rigs. So there's always a representative from GMPC, representative from Petroleum Commission on the drilling rigs, monitoring production, I mean, drilling procedures and operations. The facilities engineer, that's where I am now. So I'm, I'm a facilities engineer. And we are in charge of the linkage between getting the oil from the ground to the top. So you see the subsea installations and equipments, they're all handled by the facilities engineering team. There's the top sites, which is the oil processing, water processing, gas processing units, and that's all handled by the, the facilities team. So we do um, costing and planning, and we monitor our installations. So again, there's, there's the software that we work with is Questo, so we, you model your layout, you look at all your parameters, you look at um, your, let's just, your jumpers, your manifolds, you put everything together and it gives you the estimated cost based on current prices and stuff. So the production engineers, like I said, uh, they are always on the, on the FPSO, monitoring flow, and they participate in uh, crude lifting operations too. So, so we have a storage, let's take the Kwame Nkrumah FPSO, for example. It has storage about 1.7 million 
And um, whenever it's getting full, people come and offtake the oil. So there, there are a lot of operational hazards that, that are entailed in all these. Production engineers must be there. EHS people must be there. So they're also in charge of logging production data. So they look at all the data that has been. So the well, well logging procedures are also done by our production engineers. So this is the Botan Basin project. It's, I wouldn't say new, but it's GMPC's flagship now. We're looking at building capacity, and we're looking to use the, the onshore basis to, to build our capacity. So there's, the, there's about 40% of, of Ghana that's covered by this sedimentary basin. And GMPC now is exploring the possibility of the oil in the onshore basin in Ghana. So it's about 40 Forty percent of Ghana is about 100, almost 160,000 square feet, um, square kilometers of, of land. So it was a couple of months ago that the the seismic contract was signed. So we have a team in Tamale now. They have to perform social meetings, meet the chiefs, and all that, so that they don't they are aware of what's happening when the seismic crew goes in and, and starts. I mean entering the uh, shrines and stuff just to make sure that everything is okay, okay, no problem. So, um, okay, I should have mentioned that uh, presentation, yeah, I did, it's in two parts. So I think Bob and I will take over from here and talk about the, the IT bit and stuff. Thank you. Hello. <coughs> Hello, I am Kwabna Ohine Bonsu, as introduced earlier on, and I'm a software developer at GMPC. So, in terms of technology, we strive to deliver value to the business by meeting um, and developing, maintaining, managing all the technological resources of the corporation. And we do that in terms of the hardware, software, and networking and security. Most importantly, um, cyber security. In terms of hardware, we provide the devices and all that. Software, we have our software mainly in two parts. We have petrol business and petrotechnical software. And as a corporation, we need to marry the two, have a system that would link up our um, business software and technological software. Um, early this morning, one of our presenters from iBit mentioned SAP. And yeah, we also use SAP at GMPC. So we manage all these software and make sure they're up and running. Um, the software that's used by the technical team we have some that are used for data simulation, data analysis. And then in terms of um, security, right now cyber security is a big thing, so we use a lot of data. We have a lot of huge data that we use and manage. So we need to be up and abreast with the kind of security that we have at GMPC. So let's look at some of the elements that influence our decisions, our operations at GMPC, our day-to-day -day activities. We have our strategy and models, what actually drives what we do at GMPC. The drilling, the, the accounting, the, all the operations that we handle at GMPC. Obviously, we have to take care of our cost and the time that we spend in these operations. They are very key as well. The human resources, the people that we train, we grow to make sure they work to achieve what the objective of GMPC seeks to obtain. And then, obviously, our revenue, how much we intend to get at the end of the day. We look at the unknown, because the software that we use may not really give us the top, um, should I say, uh, what we see to achieve, right? We, we might not get everything, uh, all the information we need, so there's some level of uncertainty in there. And then also, obviously, our oil prices, because this is what will determine how much you're going to get at the end of the day. 
Now, let's look at some of the challenges. Um, I'm guessing this is where you might be interested in um, knowing. So the systems that we use do have some limitations. We might not get everything that we need from the systems because of the level of uncertainty, like I mentioned early on. And then, obviously, we have we spend a lot of money acquiring the software. The licenses and all that are extremely expensive. We spend millions of dollars acquiring all these. We have to uh, train our staff as well. Our colleague mentioned that some of our um, reservoir engineers are actually um, having some training at the moment. So these are some of the things that we, um, that we go through at GMPC. And also, obviously, our organizational culture. Our first slide um, talked about our core values. Let's face it, you're working with human beings. So you might not get everyone to really buy into your value. So how do you, how do you direct the decisions that your, uh, your staff makes so that you make sure that they work to achieve what the goal of the organization is? And then you're talking about um, economic standards as well. The economy actually has an effect on how much you get at the end of the day. So these are some of the things that we look at. Now, just to propose some few suggestions here. We talked about involvement in um, the Voltaire Basin. So this is going to be um, the first onshore operation um, of oil drilling in the country. So let's have a lot more of our people dive into that venture so that we have we improve the scale of our people and make sure that they, they can actually um, work on this project and get a lot of money for the country. We also want to increase um, local participation in oil food services, so the fabrications, the pipeline coatings. These are some researches that can be done by our local people, and we can present them to help ensure that we improve upon our oil food services. Now we're talking about um, feasibility studies in the industry as well. We, can, we have the ability to actually get um, some, some research findings from our own people. So let's look at that. It's very important. And then software development. Um, quite recently, we started developing software in-house at GMPC. So these are some of the things that we do to cut down costs, because these are um, elements that would help us increase the revenue in the country. So essentially, these are some few things that we would like to present. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'll have them now. Thank you. Shall we? Thank you. Uh, question time. Are there any questions? Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, nice presentation. Thank you. Um, why are we not refining our oil? Sorry? Why are we not refining our oil? Um, OK. My colleague will take that. Um, I would like to, for lack of better words, shift the blame to Tor. We're talking about upstream now. When, when you're talking about refining, it's, it's, it's downstream. Yeah. But I think the capacity had gone down, so I think the new government now is trying to revamp the, the whole refinery industry now. So hopefully, in a few years' time, they, they refine, but it's just in small quantities. So hopefully in a few years' time, Ghana will be able to, to refine a sus sustainable amount of, of oil that we produce. Thank you. Any more? OK. OK, I think this our uh, area, so we can ask a lot of questions if Dr. Nyaku. <laughs> OK, you, okay. you spoke about First of all, it's a good presentation, brilliant one. Thank you. Uh, petro business and petrochemical. And petrotechnical. Pe petrotechnical, thank yeah. you. Uh, both areas talking, or software applications talking to each other. Yeah. Do you have that currently? Is there a challenge? Are all your systems talking, machine, human interfaces, and all of that? Is there a gap somewhere we can fill? So we. We have some software that we use, and uh, like I mentioned, we use SAP as well. Yeah. But apart from that, we have um, we also use uh, Microsoft Cloud Computing Services, yeah. like Office 365. Yeah. These are some of the communication tools mm -hmm. we use. And having an, a huge organization like GMPC with a number of branches, you would have to make sure communication is seamless and yeah. uninterrupted. So 
um, communication is one big thing that we use to kind of like make sure we are in line with what we do. Mm. But then there's still there's still room for improvement. So mm. there are other things that we need to look at to okay. improve because them. In one of my slides, we have mm -hmm. we are talking we are the enterprise resource level, okay. and we are coming down to the machine level, and we have a software bus that is making it possible for enterprise resource, including SAP, of okay. course, to talk to whatever system you have at the bottom. So this is quite an interesting concept also for academia to research into and to come up with some sort of uh, concrete solution to ensure that all your systems are talking to each other. Finance, you know what procurement is doing. Finance, right. you know what is leaking in there, how much is costing them, yeah. and so on. So I think we can pick it up after the section. That's true. I agree. From there. Thank, you. thank you. Yes, thank you. There are a lot of opportunities in this room. And uh, I hope members, colleagues, you are taking note of them as we go. Okay, yes. Okay, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have one question, then a, a suggestion. Okay. Why is it very difficult for students to get data from GMPC? Uh, could you like to go up <laughs> in terms of data? I think you should be in the best position to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll well, try my best. <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, well, GMPC has a uh, research and, and data um, department. Yeah. And uh, even as it stands now, if, if somebody comes in with a petroleum agreement and wants to, to know what's going on, the data is in the room. They take you in there, they show you. You don't take it out. And, and that's, that's the dynamics now that, that's in GMPs. But it's all about security. Yeah. So if, if our IT could improve and then we find a way to, to protect our, 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 what do you call it, our data, I think we'll do a better job. And I was, I was speaking to Kwabna yesterday too, that I think that if GMPs could even house people, so if, say, you're working on, on a project and you need data from GMPC, I mean, I'm not in a position to, 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 to say that, but I'm just saying if we could house you, if we could bring you in, have you all the data there, work with it, just because we're, we're concerned about the data going out and the security implications with that. So I think if, if our IT improves, then we, we can actually... But I just also mentioned that, that. Um, security is one of the things that we're actually looking at. Um, we've been rolling out security measures to beef up the kind of security that we have. So there are measures to make sure that we protect our data as much as possible. It's also it's not just about the protection, but also the level of trust that we have for whoever is accessing our data. So there has to be some level of agreement. And um, maybe that might be above what Kojo and I would have to do at GMPC. So we would have to talk more about whoever is accessing our data and what is we, what would it be used for. Yeah. So the next contribution is, um, I didn't hear much about your, you mentioned acquisition, but I was yeah. expecting to talk about your, your seismic, your, your, your geophysics, because that is, that is the backbone. If you don't run, especially Fugru have done a lot of work in the Voltaire, and yeah. our students will be, uh, it's pertinent for them to come in because there are a lot of huge mathematical models that goes with the seismic reflections and refractions and uh, sedimentology and stratigraphy and stuff like that. So I was expecting to uh, enthuse the students, you know, so that so that's a suggestion. So okay. uh, I hope the students can come in because there are a lot to do, especially on the Voltaire. Yeah. Uh, I was happy with the first time I saw that because uh, there are is supposed that there's potential geological background because I am a geologist, so okay. um, I love to hear things like that. Yeah. Well, we do have a geology and geophysics department that work with um, seismic data interpretation and all that, so um, maybe something we can look at from here. Yeah. Thank you. I think I, I was going to make that point. Uh, as a lecturer, I want to see how feasible it is for me to maybe bring my students you talked about capacity building yes. and all that. How to maybe get some practical experience 
for our students. We have a lot of uh, uh, PhD candidates in all the various institutions who are doing reservoir simulation and stuff, and uh, we need that practical experience for them, exposure for them to move on. So I think uh, today you have spoken to us, and uh, very soon you will see us physically. Okay. Yes, and uh, when, we, when, when we call on you or we knock at your doors, uh, you open the door for us to at least. Uh, for your data, we will promise. Uh, I think there's always a data security policy in every uh, department or company, and uh, uh, one has to adhere to all those things all over the world, I think it is. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm pleased to pay your challenges. It appears um, acquisition of the software is questioning you a lot. Yeah. And you are even saying that if Ghana could produce all the softwares, it would be like, um, um, in terms of um, our earnings, it's going to, it's going to increase your earnings. Yeah. I want to ask, um, it appears that oftentimes, we value foreign products or um, materials more than the local ones. So I'm asking, or if, if you guys are promising that if we have individuals who will be ready or will be able to produce equally good products as you are buying, you will be ready to patronize them. I could say to the best of my knowledge that if you present your idea, if you sell your idea to us, your product, and it's going to work, we test it and we, I think it's something we can look into because we, in as much as we use SAP, we develop software in-house, okay? And these are some of the things that we do to boost up our, um, should I say, our operations in GMPC. So if you're going to give us a great product, it's something worth looking into. If you want to okay. something. And uh, currently there's this uh, local <coughs> content push that, that is it's coming on board in GMPC. And, and basically everywhere in Ghana now. So the procurement team will know much about it, but I know for, for instance, if, if two companies bring in a bid and the local one gets about 10% discount, a commercial bidding. So there are advantages for the local companies. So you have foreign companies coming in to, to have JVs with local partners just so they can have advantage during the procurement processes and stuff. So, so the opportunities are there for local, local people to get, get into GMPC. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Um, there's one. We understand that the world runs on oil. Sorry? We understand that the world runs on oil. And for that matter, we consume more oil than we produce. Uh, we have also read that in many international news outlets, in many variations, and that the global oil reserve will come to a standstill. Uh, some are saying in 2030, some two are saying in 2050 with other fossil fuels. I want to know whether your industry is developing an idea um, to, to reverse that uh, system, that replication, where we can produce more oil than we consume. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm not too sure if you're referring to the fact that um, so the renewables coming in now trying to push the fossil fuels down the line, if, if that's what you're talking about. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the way the world works now. So there are always better ways of doing things, cutting down emissions, CO2, and all that stuff. So those things with time, but uh, again, I'll stand quite now. I don't think oil is going anytime soon, though. With time, it might with, uh, with all these greenhouse effects. But... Um, your question, again, I think GMPC would hold. We will stand. We will stand. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um, thank the, you very the much. question that my colleague just asked has brought something to my head. Um, in terms of CSR, I don't know what GMPC's policy is on CSR. Um, as a petrochemical company, global warming and stuff like that, what are you doing to mitigate the effect that your product is causing to our environment? Again, that's, that's, that's a tough question. But um, 
we put measures in place. We, we try our best. But like I said, it's just like having a car. You will have emissions. You, you will have CO2s coming out. We, we do our best to, to, to try and make our industry as clean as we can. So now there's, there's the push for more gas usage now. So GMPC has is, is gone through the LNG deal trying to use the gas for power because you have less emissions. Um, even though it's petrochemicals, it's, it's, it's less than the HFOs and, and the other fuels that, that might be used. So that's the measures that we're taking. All right. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, could you, my question goes to you. I think it's, it's a formal suggestion. Uh, uh, during the presentation, you were talking about your house, the, the core values and all that. I saw one thing missing, which is uh, talent acquisition. What is GMPC doing to acquire all the talent? There are a lot of talents in the system when it comes to the expertise that you are lacking. There are even some abroad and some locally. What is GMPC doing to acquire those talents? Thank you very much. Okay, so again, this might be a question for HR, but I, I'll try my best. <coughs> so with, with, um, with capacity building, acquiring talent, is, uh, you mean acquiring talent, just new people coming in all the time, or building the capacity, what we have and people coming to? No, we have other organizations who have uh, ways of acquiring talent. Some of them come to campus uh, to do the acquisition by Organizing programs and inviting oh. students. Oh, GMPC, GMPC does. I mean, every yesterday I dropped a few guys at the hospital, at the airport. They were here for um, scholarship um, deals. So they're, they're trying to sponsor people who are into the sciences um, department. So they do come here and try to, because mm -hmm. he, was, he was at Shesi and they went to him. They, they spoke to him, you know. But so GMPC the, does that one. Yeah, we do yeah. campus engagement, right? And it's actually part of our core values as respect for talent. We do prioritize talent and the skill that people have. So if we go around the schools and we find those people, we try as much as possible to bring them on board. So it's something we do. Okay, I said yeah. that one too. There are other talents outside Ghana. Mm -hmm. Ghanaians living abroad. Some of them are very, very talented and are looking to come home but with the fear of not being absorbed into the system. So what is GMPC doing about that one too? Thank you. Uh, hello, I think uh, for that question, if you have not availed yourself, uh, GMPC cannot find you. Okay, thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. Thank you, shall we? Okay. Uh, our next presenter is going to be um, Mr. Joshua Amevialo. Uh, he is going to present on discontinuous Galekin isogeometric analysis for the biharmonic problem. Shall we welcome Joshua? Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Mivalo, and I'll be talking on discontinuous Galekin isogeometric analysis for the biomedical problem. 
uh, this actually from my master's thesis with NEMS. <coughs> so here's an outline for representation. And I saw geometric analysis was proposed in 2005 by Hughes and his team. And the idea is to um, use the same basic functions that are used in most designer packages for analysis. Okay. And the, the basic functions are B splines and NEPs. And this actually came up as a way to minimize the, code, the time spent in converting the, the messages from the design applications to the analysis applications. Okay. So here is an illustration of what happens with finite element meshes and isogeometric meshes. So the first, if you look at the top, that's what, what we have at the top are, is a finite element mesh of the bracket on the left. And what you have down is the, the nerves mesh for the same bracket. As you can see from the top, some of the features have been removed in the mesh generation using the finite element analysis. The holes are gone, and some of the, the curves in the L are also gone. By using the isogeometric analysis, all the features are maintained. So we have the exact geometry of the computational domain. Okay. It has also been noted that about 80% of the time spent on, on analysis is actually used for the new generation of the mesh or the mesh conversion from the geometric models to the analysis forms. Okay. And most computational domains cannot be represented using a, a, this, a single nerves geometry mapping and are thus decomposed into several subdomains or patches. And because of this, coupling strategies for the patches are an important and active area of research in IGA. Now the DG methods or the discontinuous, the discontinuous Gallica methods uh, provide a natural means of coupling the multiple patches in IGA. And this has been tested and analyzed using several second order PDs. But to extend the applicable scope of the method, there's a need to analyze the method in the context of higher order PDs. Now, the model for this work was the biomony problem, which is an example of a fourth order electric PD, and occurs in linear elasticity, fluid dynamics, and part information, among others. Now, the B splines are constructed using node vectors, and a node vector in one dimension is um, an undecreasing set of coordinates in the parameter space, which is represented here by Xi. The basis functions are constructed recursively using the cox de Borg recursion formulas given by equations one and two. <coughs> so here's an example of a bioquadratic B spline surface with a corresponding control net. The nerves are constructed from the B splines using the weighted function given by equation three. With the basis functions in one dimension given by equation four and the corresponding curves given by equation five. In two dimensions, the basis functions are given by equation six. Now, for the subsequent derivations, we assume that the computational domain is actually made up of several non-overlapping subdomains, represented here by TH. And the simplest case is in figure three, where we have just two subdomains with the FIJ being the interface between the subdomains omega i and omega j. Now, the parametric mesh is given by seven, which can be transformed to the physical mesh using the transformations phi i and phi j as shown in figure four. So the regular version of the boundary problem is given by eight, which is a fourth order PD with the, just the, the regular boundary conditions. And the space under consideration here will be the broken sub space presented here by H4 omega TH, as defined here. So using the green space identity and introducing some symmetric consistent terms, we get the variational form given by equation nine, with the linear form given by, with the bilinear form given by equation 10 and the linear form given by 11. And the first term in, on the right-hand side of equation 10, it just, it's just the bilinear form you get using the standard Galican approach and summed over the, the uh, subdomains. The next four terms are symmetric consistency terms which handle the fluxes over the interfaces and the last two term, terms are penalty terms that weakly enforce continuity over the interfaces. Now in 11, the Nietzsche approach was used to weakly enforce the boundary conditions. So we, a finite dimensional nerve subspace space is obtained from the broken sub space, and with that, the discrete DGIJ scheme is given by 12, with the discrete Berliner form given by 13, and the discrete linear form given by 14. Now for the subsequent analysis, the discrete norm given by 15 is defined and to show for more than this, another discrete norm, which is here given by 16, is also defined. Now, Lemma 3.1 provides the um, IGA versions of the inverse inequalities used in uh, proving coercivity of the bilinear form. And this was shown by Moore in Moore 2017. 
Now, Lama 3.2 provides some intermediate, value, intermediate results for coercivity. Now, the inequalities 13 and 20 provide some bounds for the consistency terms in the Berliner form. So Lama 3.3 is a statement about the coercivity of the Berliner form, and Lama 3.4 is a statement about the boundedness of the Berliner form in terms of the two discrete nouns defined earlier. Uh, now, this is actually the prerequisites for the existence and uniqueness of the solution to a problem using the, using the scheme, which is according to the Laxmergram lemma. Okay. Now, term 3.1 provides the local interpolation error estimates for NEVS based IGA. And this was shown in Basilev et al. 2006. Now, lemma 3.5 provides the global interpolation error estimates for the scheme in terms of the two norms defined earlier. So using all that, and there are some results that, not, that are not shown here, some intermediate results. And using all that, we have the, we have term 3.2, which provides the apiary error estimates for the scheme. And the HR here is the, the mesh size, and the exponent is the order of convergence of the scheme, which in this case depends on the regularity of the exact solution, as well as the, the degree of the nerve basis functions used to approximate the solution. So here, what we actually used in the, the G scheme we used was the symmetric in, interior penalty method, and that's what we used to get the, the DGIJ scheme for this particular problem. And as I said earlier, coercivity and boldness, they are the requirements for existence and uniqueness of the solutions to the problem. And the error estimates of the end indicates that we expect the mechanical results to converge ultimately in the norm defined. And as I said earlier, what we used for the derivation was the SIPG method, but there are other DG methods that can also be used for the derivation. And the APR error estimates obtained correspond to convergence analysis and the mesh refinements, but can also be studied with respect to the polynomial refinements and a combination of the two. So here are some references, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, if there are no, uh, not, uh, one question. I would have asked one. Okay. Thank you very much, Joshua, for that nice presentation. Um, I realized that you were using more of Gellerkin's method. Yeah. And um, I want to know how the weight function affects, I mean, the creation of the mesh. I mean, the, the weight doesn't really, the weight in the nerves, okay. basis function. Yeah. Doesn't really affect. They, it just part of the basis function. That really affected the Galakian method. Okay, so just a part of the basis functions. Okay. Uh, please, can, can you go, go to equation, equation um, 11 or so? Ah, it's okay. Uh, no, the other slide. Okay, yeah. it's equation 8. Okay, so you define u as a function that takes um, uh, omega. But omega, omega is the domain of the, 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 the domain of the problem. Okay, you take the domain onto the set of real numbers. Yeah. And then you, you found the grad of um, u. That's the that's the, um, the Laplacian, the square of the Laplacian. Yeah, yeah. Or of, of the u, and then uh, you, I mean, you assign f to it, right? No, that's, that's the back harmonic problem. That's, that's the back harmonic problem. Okay. So that's just the equation, the back harmonic equation. Oh, okay, it's not really an assignment. No, 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 that's, it's a fault of the PDE. Okay. So the, the, the Laplacian square is the same as the grad to the power four. Okay. So you you um, should actually be um, perhaps sometimes differentiable. I mean, um, diffeomorphic. Like you you should be able to um, differentiate you yes, a number of yes, times. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Joshua, uh, uh, I've seen something like. Uh, Solar space, seen something like uh, some functions. What, what are they? What is the solar space and uh, those functions that you are talking about? Okay. The solar spaces are actually the spaces where we find solutions to PDEs. So they just refer to the possible solutions of the, the PD. That's how we classify solar spaces. So they have to be functions with some properties. The first has to be differentiable up to a certain order. The order of the 
The other fetchability is also called the regularity of the solution that we are looking for. So that's, that's what the similarities are. Okay. Okay. Uh, Joshua, sure. nice presentation. Um, since the problem is supposed to be taken from a real life situation, yeah. what accounts for us having a biharmonic problem under uh, what kind of circumstance? As I mentioned earlier, it's, 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 it's actually, actually of interest in this area. The median elasticity, fluid dynamics, particle formation, and solid mechanics. So, if you, if you know the Benoli um, oil beam problem, that's actually a fault. It has some fault, fault order um, elliptic, elliptic terms in it. And the template equations can also involve um, biharmonic terms. Okay. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, you can take your seat. Kichai. Thank you. Our next presenter is um, Dr. Edmond Yambra. Shall we welcome Dr. Edmond Yambra? He's uh, speaking on the uh, improvement and validation of weather driven dynamical mathematical modeling. So, thank you very much. My name is Edmond Yamba, and um, I would like to share with you some excerpts of some modeling activities that I do. My background is uh, meteorology and climate science, and um, I also look at, do some, see, try to look at how climate impacts disease epidemics uh, by modeling. So, today I will be uh, sharing with you some information. And, uh, before I begin, I would like to say that I prepared these slides in, in just an hour ago. So if there are any typos, please find it, pardon me. Okay. Um, I would like to begin this presentation by with this um, African proverb that um, if you think you are too small to make any change, try spending the night with a mosquito. And I know very well that most of us here uh, will, will associate ourselves with this uh, proverb that in the night you are lying down and you have mosquito hovering around your, your ear, you can imagine that kind of nuisance. And so with this, it was part, part of um, some kind of motivation that um, we would like to see what it is. Malaria is everywhere, not everywhere, but in most parts of the world we can find malaria. And when you look at the world, maybe in, in Asia we can find malaria, in Africa, in Latin America, but when you compare the prevalence of malaria, you can see that the burden or the prevalence in Africa is much more, uh, much more compared to other areas. Okay, and even not all of the Africa, but then the Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, and um, I have some excerpts here from who estimates of malaria in 2015. And if you look at the um, malaria cases, worldwide record of malaria cases, you will find that Africa is contributing 88%. And out of the 88% of malaria cases that are coming from Africa, you find that all the death cases worldwide, Africa is contributing 90%. And out of this 90%, 75% of the 90% of people who die out of malaria 
are from children below um, five years. Okay. So this is kind of like a motivation that uh, I was like, okay, how do we contribute to keeping malaria in sub-Saharan Africa? So with this, I have a very simple uh, talk here, and I would like to look at how climate and environment is contributing that. And then I will take you through some few weather models and how I validated these models and the kind of improvement work that I did to these uh, malaria models. If we already, when I showed you the malaria bed in, Af um, in the world, you could see that Africa had a lot of uh, impact here. And one of the contributing factors is the fact that the climate and environment of Africa is very suitable for the mosquito, which kind of like is the vector of malaria. Okay. And here, if you, if you take, so basically, what um, climate and environment does is that it influences the development dynamics of the mosquito and that of the parasite. If you look at temperature, for example, some research, you will find that temperature range that supports malaria transmission is between 18 degrees and 40. And you can have optimum between 18 and 22. Rainfall, in general, just provides breeding grounds. Okay. If I take temperature specifically, like I mentioned already, take this mosquito again, like just taking human blood. The, the rate at which this blood would digest in this mosquito depends on temperature. So if, and, and the thing is that the faster the blood digests within the mosquito, the faster or the more the mosquito will look for people to bite. And so once it bites more people, it means that you have much more eggs being laid at a faster rate. And then you have, now if you take this larvae, for example, which is developing in, in water, the development rate of this larvae is also dependent on water temperature as well. So if you already look at these temperature ranges and you look at Africa and compared to other worlds, for example, you can already see that the temperature ranges that we have here are very suitable. We will come to see that other factors could also be like uh, the kind of mosquito vectors that we have here in, in Africa. Yeah. And this is just also an example for, uh, from rainfall, how it affects malaria. Yeah. Apart from just these climatic factors, we can have other factors like hydrology, and in case of hydrology, you are looking at um, river bodies, you are looking at irrigation and other things. And they all influence, if you take uh, topography, um, elevated areas have lower malaria compared to, say, um, uh, areas that are not elevated, for example. Or you can, uh, population density, if you take population density, rural areas have more malaria compared to urban areas. Or if you take immunity, so the amount of immunity I have will depend uh, also influence that. Or the anthropophilic behavior of mosquitoes or the vector type. Okay. So having gone through trying to look at all these um, major factors that drive malaria, um, it now gave me an understanding of how to tackle the problem. So if you have all these multiple factors, you cannot, uh, it, uh, to solve this will mean that you have to look at some modeling activities here. So I went ahead to see, okay, um, do we have some models already that are capturing or looking at all these uh, factors? And then I saw that, okay, we have uh, already a Liverpool malaria model, and we have these guys as the pioneers. Actually, with the Liverpool mal malaria, you have version 2004, and uh, this guy, uh, Forka here, tried to make some improvement with it. And then a very interesting one, which uh, I'll be our focus on is the vector tree. And it's a vector bond disease uh, model from uh, Trieste, uh, Trieste in, if you know, ICTP, for example. And this, uh, Adrian is the engineer in, in this case here. So I tried to look, and I saw that, okay, these models uh, try to look at climate uh, environment in, in their modeling. So then, if you have these models existing, um, what do I do? So, to play around, I decided to, uh, so what I have here, maybe before I come back there, is just the diagram of, um, in other words, explaining the life cycle. So you have the mosquito goes to bite the human being, it picks the blood, the blood digests, it goes to lay the eggs, the eggs grow into smaller mosquitoes before they mature, and as they mature, they go to look for human being again, and then back. And the point is that, all these processes that, that goes through, so for example, from uh, taking the blood, laying the eggs, growing, they are all dependent on temperature. And 
when it gets to another fact is that the only place where you will not find temperature dependence will be when the parasite gets into the human body. So when the mosquito bites the human body, it gives the parasite. First, it stays in the liver before it gets to your bloodstream. And at the point where it gets to your bloodstream, that's where you begin to have some uh, feel feverish or so, for example. Now, in a very similar fashion, you have the vector model also looking at it from that angle. But what this guy, uh, the model is doing here is like, it tries to also look at the, so this part, yesterday I had some colleagues talking about compartmental models where they look at, um, yeah. So here, you look at the host population. Host population is the human beings. Then you have the, the vector, the mosquito. And in this case, we are looking at the adult mosquitoes. And then this section is looking at the, the younger mosquitoes that are growing from, say, some pools or something like that. Okay. So you have all this network here. And you have, so you have a very young mosquito. Uh, it goes, when the eggs laid, it goes through a number of steps. It matures into an older one. Then it begins to look for blood. As it looks for blood, okay, assuming it takes the blood, the blood goes through, so it, it, you have some kind of uh, processes here which I wouldn't uh, talk much. Maybe someone has questions later on. Okay. Then, um, then uh, how it connects to the human host here already. So, first, to deal with these models, what I had to do was, okay, let me try to see whether these models um, really do a good job in simulating malaria for Africa. And you, you will find that most of the models, what they do is they just look at um, how uh, uh, look at the climate suitability. So they just use temperature, rainfall, and then they try to simulate malaria. Then you have others will be using malaria prevalence or cases that are taken from hospitals. But then the problem with this kind of cases is that uh, they are more or less like an aggregated windows of several transmissions. So it is not very reliable. Okay. So, but then what is much interesting is the entomological inoculation rate. And if you look at this factor, it's more or less like just looking at the number of infectious mosquito bites a person receives per day or per unit time. And this measure here is kind of much more related to temperature, um, uh, climate, and environment. Here, the number of infectious mosquito bites you receive will depend on the mosquitoes that are available. And the number of mosquitoes that are available depends on, say, temperature influence, like I already explained. So I find this measure to be much more better in using it to assess them. So then I had to go look for this data. And the point is that it's very difficult getting this kind of data. To get this data, usually entomologists who go about doing this kind of work, they have to hire people. And what they do is that you have to sit in the night, maybe you go to a particular locality, you sit in the night for, from morning, uh, evening to the next day, and then you are given some kind of touchlights or something like that, and any mosquito that comes to sit on you, you try to catch it. And when they catch it, at the end of the day, what you have to do is to count all the number of mosquitoes that you have caught for that night. So that will be like assuming that, okay, they are going to be the number of mosquitoes that try to bite you that day. Then they then take these mosquitoes and go to the lab and try to see how many of those mosquitoes had uh, the parasite in their salivary glands. And then they, the fraction of the mosquitoes, so you now multiply uh, those that are biting you and the fraction of the mosquitoes that had the um, uh, uh, parasite in their glands to give you what we call the infectious bite you will receive per day. So this is how we get this data. But this is very expensive to do. I couldn't do it. I don't even have the money to do. So what I did was go into do some literature survey. So what I did was, OK, some, uh, if you take like uh, KCCR or um, Nabrungo Research Center or Kentampo Research, they do this kind of work. So I went into looking at some uh, publications that they have made and tried to digitize this data from those kind of plots that they, they have. So this is um, when I look, I was looking for papers from all over Africa. And these are the locations where I got uh, some data. And this is just a topographical map here. So the red ones are like areas, areas telling me, OK, these are rural areas. I have per urban or urban locations here. So this, was, this is kind of like uh, areas where I simulated the data, got the data. Then, I already explained the influence of temperature and other factors here. And so 
I, I tried, tried to make a temperature profile, profile for Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and you can see that, like, um, if you take, so I tried to divide them. I have the warmer areas here to be, say, the Sahel. Maybe another region here, I can have it, like, uh, have another name for here, and then you have the Guinea. And then if you look at this place, also a different uh, temperature. So I call it Equatorial West Africa. And then when you go to, like, Tanzania, uh, sorry, this is Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda somewhere here, and Tanzania somewhere here. Also, this place had a different, uh, and then you find the Victoria somewhere here. Okay. So I try to group them because the environments differ. So if the environment differ, climate differ, then it, it, it will not make sense to try to combine all of them. You need to separate them. So I try to uh, separate them. And when I was also gathering data, I try to, each of the places where I digitized the data, I try to see which kind of mosquitoes were given this kind of, um, uh, given this data. And then here I have the AG to be the Anopheles gambiae, Anopheles fenestus, arabiansis, nili, and marchetti here. And so these are their distributions. And you will find that the red one, especially the most uh, effective malaria vectors you can find in Africa here, are these first three, uh, Anopheles gambiae, uh, fenestus, and arabiansis. And this is also one of the reasons why we have uh, malaria to be, uh, malaria prevalence in Africa to be very high, because you can find the most effective and infectious, um, effective mo uh, mo vectors in Africa compared to other areas. So temperature is one, uh, climate and environment, and also the type of vector. And this is the simple reason explaining why we have malaria. So it's not our fault that we have. It's just um, uh, by virtue of nature. So what, what I did was, um, those models, what they did was, okay, they simulating malaria. And it can tell you every month, so for example, if I take uh, Kumasi or KMSC, you can simulate malaria for KMSC. But they never validated, like, say, if I want to see from January to December what the output looks like. So I used the data, and then I tried the two models, and I wanted to see their errors inside. And the shaded regions uh, I have here are just the, the data that I did. And what I did there was just calculating their standard deviation. And then this red line, uh, the red line is for the Liverpool malaria, and then the green line, no, sorry, the red line is vectory, and then the green line is for Liverpool malaria model. Dor, and then can, I you, just, can you speed up a little? Speed up? Yeah. Oh, okay. Finish. All right. And so I was just looking at their, their error here. And then I could see that the MAE is a mean absolute error. And then I could see that, okay, you, you still find that the, the error margins are higher in, in, in especially like warm areas like uh, Eritrea and others. The same thing, I tried to calculate the biases. Okay, how, uh, when they simulate the malaria, um, how close or near are these malaria models here? So when I saw the errors, then I was like, okay, one way I can contribute to it is to look at immunity because one of the models, immunity is miss, missing. So, but if you look at immunity, immunity differ depending on ages. So if the younger you are, the less immunity you are, you have, and the older you are, the more immunity you have. So I consider this factor here. And then I have a, a scheme here that explains how all this immunity was modeled here. So maybe later on if you want to, I can explain that for you. So when I constructed that, I now uh, modeled the immunity, and then I included it into the vector model. And so this is now the new version with the red. And then I, when I tried to calculate the, uh, the error again, I saw that, okay, when I included the, uh, the error inside, the immunity, the error reduced. So this is, the black one is uh, without immunity, and then the red one is when the immunity was inside. Okay. So um, this is the kind of improvement that it so, uh, very free is a weather driven malaria model. It can simulate seasonal malaria. Um, using, uh, including immunity in, into it, improve it. And then the model at the moment is currently used. You can simulate and forecast malaria weekly, monthly, annually for Africa or any location you want to find here. Yeah. And then we can also use the uh, model for, for example, um, if you want to assess control measure, uh, measurement, control measures like. Uh, distributing uh, insecticide treated nets, you want to see whether they are effective. You can also use this model to do that kind of assessment for you. Right. 
So these are just my research background, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, uh, are there questions for Dr. Yamba? Okay, the first one here. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned uh, that population density sure. is a factor. Sure. And you, you said that uh, there, uh, there's a higher amount, uh, should I say, the rate at which malaria is in the rural areas is greater than that in the urban areas. Yeah. And I was looking at the population densities in both. So how does it affect what's So the when, when the, the, the population, the, you have lower population density in a rural area compared to uh, an urban area. So the biting ratio is lower in urban area compared to. Um, so for example, just take, if I take the, um, Say maybe this section is a rural area, and I take the whole of these people here as an urban area, and then I have the same population of mosquitoes biting. You, you the, the rural people, because the numbers are smaller, you have higher biting rate compared to uh, more people in an urban area. Uh, what about the activities involved in the like population? Activities? Like indirect uh, activities that can also influence the mosquitoes. Since uh, there is a higher number of people in the urban areas, the activities there. Uh, yeah, so for example, there can be one activity that can also influence the, um, is, uh, for example, because it's an urban area, uh, I, let me say they have a more civilized life, let me put it that way, in, in quotes. So for example, like they, would, they live in better houses, uh, better housing, or they have access to hospital and what have you. So these are indirect activities that can influence that. But when you go to, say, rural areas, you will not find that. Yeah. Okay, the next question. Thank you for your presentation. Please, I want to know uh, how certain you are about your model calibration, since we haven't seen any structural parameter analysis or practical parameter identification analysis. Because I'm coming from the background where minimum SSE is not a guarantee for robust Parameter identification. M minimum what? SSE. SSE. Some of square error. Come uh, again. I want to know how certain you are about your model identification. Because I haven't seen any practical parameter identification or structural parameter identification. Since those things are very important in knowing the data points that carry the most information for your estimation process. So I want to know how certain you are about your model calibration. And then minimum SSE is also not a guarantee for robust estimation. So I want to know how certain you are about your model calibration. Um, so you, you are you're talking about some terms here. I don't really know what you what you are Please, if you can limit your question to what he, the methods he used. Yeah, because um, I am completely lost. I don't know what you, you want. But if you are talking about certainty, I am very certain about the model. No. Okay. Uh, my question is about how certain are you about your model calibration? That's all. The, the model calibration, very certain. I'm very certain about that. Maybe if I don't convince you, can. Thank you. Um, you can see me after. <coughs> Dr. Edmond Yambra, please can you go to the slide where you showed us the mean absolute percentage error? Uh, the first, or, okay, this is an example. So maybe back to what he's trying to say. Uh, this is a discrete data. So I'm wondering how you have a shaded pattern under this discrete uh, data representation because mean absolute percentage are, yes, they are in percentages, but my understanding also is that the black and red line, the data there correspond to the same scale, which are yes. estimates coming from the models. So perhaps that's what he wanted to ask you. Okay. Those are the parameters. Yeah. But they are on the same scale as the M. AG or MEP, which is on the y axis. Because, because you have time on the, uh, the, the, the thing is that if you, 
you are talking about this shaded part. Yes. The shaded region is the standard deviation of the observed data, the data that I, I digitized. The red lines are the simulations. So you have, um, um, I was trying to make some measure and, and trying to see, OK, how do I measure whether this is going to I understand. Are they of the same scale? Are they all in percentages? That's what I want to know. Yes, everything is in percentages. So you have months that are discrete, but you calculated the, the, the MAE. Because so you have used the shaded. Let, let, me, let me give you a little bit of explanation here. Yeah. If, if I, I take January, for example, I have, um, so this is, this is an, let's say maybe this is Kitura, East Africa. All the, the regions within there where I had uh, data points for January, I have an, an average for them. I have an average for February, so December, okay. And then, uh, so I just try to calculate what the standard deviation, uh, the standard deviation of that observed data. Good. And then I try to I get compare that to. I get to yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Because me as a statistician or mathematician, right. if I see the shaded area, I'm assuming continuity, okay. So I would have rather seen it as error bars to represent each data point. Okay. And to use the shaded, you know, area. Okay. Like that's my, my, okay. my suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Edmond. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, Doctor is always with us. You can see him and then for clarification. Uh, we'll uh, take our next speaker and uh, we have to get some female flavor. So we invite Miss Christiana Santi. Yes. She'll be talking about uh, legendary pencil transforms and its applications. Good afternoon to you all. I'm Asante Christiana, presenting on the Legend of Financial Transform and its applications. We talk of the Legend of Financial Transform to mean a procedure for transforming the information content of a function using different independent variables like the derivative of the function. So this is the outline of my presentation from introduction through to the references. This the legend of financial transform was introduced by, was named after Leandra Maria Frenchel, Legendra and Devona Frenchel. Uh, Andra Maria Frenchel first, Andra Maria Legendra first introduced the transform and later on Frenchel took a rigorous mathematical application on this transform. He studied the variation formula and then applied it to non-differentiable and non-convex function. So in a nutshell to me, the transformation of the legendra transform by Fenchel to a non-differentiable and non-convex function is said to be the legendra Fenchel transform. It's not working. Okay. So I'll 
the uses of this transform, this transform provides a connection between the Lagrangian and the, the Hamiltonian, and also provides the relation in its internal energy and the various thermodynamic potentials. So we define the energy differential transform of a variable function to mean the F star of P to be equal to the supremum from X in R, P of X minus F of X. Where our P is our slope and F star of P is the convex conjugate. And F then star is our transformation. This transform can also be defined using the infimum by just placing a negative sign at the right place. So we took an example considering the negative logarithm function, which is a convex function. We define it as f of x is equal to minus log of x. When using the general function transform on it, we had a negative logarithm function. So the function attains the maximum when our differential, first differential is equal, with respect to x is equal to zero. So this is valid when our slope is less than zero. I made mention of a convex function. So it means a, a function, a rubber function, is said to be convex if uh, for any two variables x and y in R and for t an element of zero one, the inequality above is the inequality above holds. These inequalities means that for any line segment connecting any two points on the curve is always lies above the curve. So we have a theorem that the Legend of Frenchal transform is always convex. That means using that transform defined as f star of p to be equal to the supremum p of x is minus f of x, we can always have a convex inequality. And this is our convex inequality with the legend of Fenchel transform. The applications of this transform, I first made mention of this transform having a connection, helps in the connection of the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian. So if the Lagrangian and the, and the Hamiltonian, you are able to derive our Hamiltonian from our Lagrangian by just switching the velocity functions to a momentum function. So in this case, you have a Lagrange equation of motion to be at above, where we have a conjugate momentum also to be the differential of the Lagrangian with respect to. So we have our KI to be the generalized coordinates. We have our KY star to be the velocity and T to be our time. So it's just a switch from the velocity coordinates to the momentum coordinates. So that's basically the idea of the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian, just the switch from the velocity coordinates to the Hamiltonian. Uh, momentum coordinates, and the trick needed for doing this is the legend of Fenchel transform. So we had an example where we consider the Lagrangian to be this, the function above. So the Lagrangian of this, the legend of Fenchel transform of this function be defined as the supremum P, Q minus the Lagrangian that we are given. So and then we have our conjugate momentum, which is the the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to our generalized coordinates. So for any stationary point, our first differential with respect to Q is equal to zero. Then we have our, so further on we have our Hamiltonian to be a function of generalized coordinates and momentum, which is equal to the negative of the Lagrangian, which is a function of generalized coordinates and velocity at the point where our momentum is equal to zero. And then so we have our Hamiltonian equations of motions above. Secondly, this transform also has an application in thermodynamics where if we use this to derive our various thermodynamic potentials. So this it's crazy. It also establishes the relation between the internal energy and the various thermodynamic potentials. 
That is to mean that we have internal energy, we can derive our various thermodynamic potentials that we have. So the basic idea of Legenda Fenshaw transform in thermodynamics is to switch the function with, that depends on the variable to a new function that depends on a new variable. That is our mu the new variable means the partial derivative of the original variable with respect to our original partial derivative of our original function with respect to our original variable. So by our thermodynamic uh, law, our first uh, law of thermodynamics, we have uh, the sum of uh, internal energy to be equal to the uh, change in internal energy to be equal to the sum of heat and work. So by using the legendary potential transform on internal energy and with volume as a constant, with respect to a volume, then we derive a thermodynamic potential called enthalpy, where enthalpy is an explicit function of pressure. And then further on, we can also shift a dependence of energy from extensive variables to... two minutes more. We can also shift the dependence of extensive variables to intensive variables, where we obtain a, another a thermodynamic potential called the Gibbs free energy and Hamilton free energy. So this thermodynamic potential, named the Gibbs and Hamilton free energy, is also obtained. This Hamilton free energy is, you know, I don't have it in my slide. This Hamilton free energy is when the is the maximum amount of work done when the temperature and volume are held constant. And the Gibbs free energy is the maximum amount of work done when the temperature and pressure are kept constant. This Gibbs free energy also relates the, the property of a system with also changing the entropy of the universe. These are some of our references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Christiana Santi. Please, are there any questions? Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, this is quite technical. You have a derivative of your Lagrangian being equal to something. My question is, if the derivative of your Lagrangian exists at a certain point, would you conclude that it is continuous there? And if it is, is the converse true? Thank you. Please, are you talking about this example? Uh, yeah, you could talk about and conjugate momentum P equal to uh, partial derivative of L with respect to Q. You can see on that side. Yeah, okay. Would you say if this exists at a point, then whatever you have there is continuous? Your arrangement will be continuous there. If yes, is the converse true? Exists at a point that's in. You are finding a derivative there. Yeah, you are finding a derivative of Lagrangian with respect to Q. And I'm saying if, if the derivative exists at a certain point there, will you say it is continuous at that point? Yeah, once our derivative exists, it's continuous at, because we mean a co continuity implies differentiability. So that's once a lie. it exists at that point, it's that, that's continuous a lie. at that point. Is the converse true? When our derivative does not exist at that point. All right, thank but you. It's, yes, it's always true because the vice versa is not. Thank you. The next question. Oh. Okay, I'll ask. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you just said that uh, continuity implies... 
Okay, my question is, um, in one of your slides, uh, what, is the, what is the range of X? I think I didn't capture the slides, the slide number, but can you go to the previous slides? Can you go again? Okay, yeah, yeah. Please calm down a little. So I saw, no, not here. I saw X belonging to R. And then, then in your next slides, can you come there? Okay, in one of your slides, I saw uh, a logarithm function having uh, an argument of x. And you are saying that x also belongs to the real number. Right, yes, yeah, so f of x equals log x. So if x belongs to the entire real number, and we know that log function is not defined as negative numbers, so how then do you explain this? This is an example. I'm trying to use an example of the transform that I've given. So I'm trying to use a, uh, I first define that my function should be a convex function. So it's just an example of a convex function that I'm trying to put in my uh, transform to see how it would look like. So yeah, and our x is from my elements. Our x is from the set of real numbers. I think uh, she there is an omission. She will correct that. She should have said maybe x r plus or something. Uh -huh. So okay. she will correct that. Next, Next question. question. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, by now everybody is uh, feeling some hunger. So we would like to take our lunch and uh, come back here at 1. Thank you. Oh, at 2, at 2, sorry. We are coming back at 2.